Thank you for tuning into Trevor Talks Podcast, where we talk to real people about real topics and real stories. Today's guest is a powerhouse voice of faith. She is a businesswoman, television personality, and social media influencer, and she's even considered one of the most influential and inspirational Latinas in the world. She has a new book out now called God is Your Defender, and such a powerful testimony that she has to go with that. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Miss Rosie Rivera. Rosie, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Trevor. I'm glad to be here with you. Yeah. As I said in the intro, I'm just super intrigued by your story. And even the fact that they call you one of the most influential and inspirational Latinas in the world, where did all of that start? That's such I a I don't big know who point. they is, but that's pretty cool. <laughs> but yeah. And it, you're a mother of three and you have a husband and you balance all of this. You're an author of five books now. Come on. That's a yeah, full time. It's- you know, I was a little girl that loved to read. Um, actually, reading was one of my coping mechanisms as a child. So now to be able to give that back into the world is like full circle. And mm. it, it's just, I'm a, I'm a bookworm. And I think I always will be. I love that so much. And do you remember going into bookstores as a child and just seeing books on the shelf and being like, oh, a library and being like, I want to do that one day? Yes, I'm the I'm the girl that used to like smell the books. The older books intrigue me. They're so gorgeous, like first editions. And um, I just remember wanting every single book in the Babysitter's Club collection. Just like yeah. I couldn't wait for the next one. And and now it, it's kind of fun. My kids don't read as much, but just yesterday, my eight year old asked me to take her to a Barnes and Noble. And I don't know if it's for her or more for me, because they all know that that's like the perfect place to take me just have a cup yeah. of coffee and just like read through books. Just, I could be there all day. And what's it like to show your children, your book, the finished product, something that you've put your heart and soul into. And mind you, <laughs> the books are very vulnerable. They're opening up about your story, which we're definitely going to dive into because there's just so much to unpack, but that does that have any, like along with this question, does that have any influence on what you put into the books, what your kids are going to read one day? Definitely. Uh, right now, showing my kid, my eight-year-old, you know, and my four-year-old, my books, um, it is easy, you know, to them. I, I let them see that it's something that, that takes time and dedication and you pour your heart into and, and it's a finished product. For them, it's like, hey, finish what you start. Um, for my 18-year-old, I mean, this book is cake compared to what I had to talk to her about when with my first book, um, mm-hmm. with my broken pieces just letting her know before she found out in an interview, in a story, before she read it, um, was, was a little bit challenging. I mean, I think the scariest thing that I had to tell her was that I had had an abortion because I was putting it in the book and explaining some of the stories about her and, and her dad, because her dad and I separated when I was pregnant with her. So I wanted to be very mindful of my daughter and if there was anything she didn't want me to put in there, I was going to respect it. And also her, her dad, he's a great father. And, and now we're great co-parents, thank God. Um, but I was, I was mindful of him while still keeping it really honest. It's still my story. I'm not trying to offend him, but I, I do think it's important to tell my story. And, and my daughter understood and didn't judge me. And uh, she knows she has a sister in heaven now. And, and it even drew us closer. Mm. Was that an emotional conversation to have with your 18 year old daughter? It was really scary for me. I mean, I have done a lot of crazy things in my life. Things that sometimes I'm, I'm still preaching on an altar and, and my mind wants to say, ah, you don't have to say that. You know, I was addicted to pornography and confused about my sexuality and, and just so, I mean, I was very promiscuous in, in my teenage years. So things like that. But this was even scarier than like saying all that to in front of 3000 people. It's it's my daughter who who thinks I'm amazing and I've never wanted to make her think I'm perfect. I, I'm just me. I think it's the best thing that I can do for her in her walk with Christ. I don't ever want her to to leave home and say, oh, now I'm in the real world. No, this is the real world. And, and if and if you and, and if I'm upset with my husband at home, we're going to go to church and we're not going to fight at church, but I'm not holding his hand and not, not to be petty, but to show my child I'm the same. And so this is so scary for me. It was, I was full of emotion. I prayed a lot about it, about how to describe it, about how to 
give her my reasons for an abortion without giving any judgment on anybody involved and, and really having her understand me as a woman, as a person. And, and granted, she was only 12 or 13, but still, I thought it was very important for her to hear it from me. And I didn't know what her reaction was going to be, you know, like, mom, are you horrible? Or, hey, yeah, you know, um, who cares? And no, she she genuinely cared. And there was just relief at the end and even joy. And I had never considered that I had four children. It was through my daughter who's like, hey, I have an older sister and she's in heaven. And that was really healing for me. So it, it was a surprise. That is, that's that's a testimonial on its own. So many people have had <laughs> and recovered from uh, sexual abuse and trauma. And the really unique thing about your story is not everyone grew up in the public eye. Um, what we haven't touched on yet is your sister, Jenny Rivera, was a mega star. So you've been bullied on national TV. You've been on a ton of TV shows. You worked side and side with Telemundo to produce stuff for Netflix. Like You have an extravagant life that People get to see, but you're just a real person at the end of the day and you have real stories to share. So I'd really love to dive into the beginning, like from your childhood on how God has moved in your life and your life story. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm living someone else's dream. Uh, when people call me an influencer, it, it surprises me. That was never the goal. I love to have influence. It's an honor to have influence over one person's life. But a social media influencer or, or being on TV or producing a show for Netflix or Telemundo is, I never dr even dreamt of it. Um, but I did, I had prayers, you know, when, when God healed me from sexual abuse, I wanted to reach out and grab every single woman, child, man that had been through it and, and say, Hey, I have, a, I have a, I have a solution. I want to share it with you. And so my prayers began like, Hey God, let me reach 2 million people. I don't know, you know, and, but how was I going to do that? Um, in, in, in my private, you know, 200 people church. So God heard and knows the cry of my heart and gave me these platforms that I consistently remind myself to use for him. Yeah. That's amazing. Where did it all start for you? My battle began when I was eight. I mean, my dad used to sit me on his lap. I was four years old, five, six. And, and my dad would sit me on his lap to have breakfast with him. Oh, I would kind of join him and I'd ruin it. I'd sneeze all over it because I was allergic to his cologne. Didn't find out till years later. And my mom would say, she, don't let her do it. She's going to ruin your dinner, and uh, your breakfast. And dad would say, she's my kid. She couldn't ruin anything. And he would eat it. <laughs> and, uh, that's when I knew mercy deep in my soul without knowing the name. I, I knew like, hey, you can't ruin it. You make mistakes or there's an issue going on, but ruin it. And and my dad used to ask me like, what are you going to be when you grow up? But it wasn't like me by myself or me wondering. It was more like, I want to know because your dad is going with you. And so I used to tell him things like, I want to be an astronaut. You can do it. I mean, I didn't even know that I wouldn't meet so many of the requirements, health, intelligence, financial. We were Mexican-American family. They were immigrants. We were poor. And he didn't tell me any of those limitations. He just told me you could do it. I, I guess he knew the world would tell me the limitations. He was giving me that. The, he, was no, he was letting me know of the power I have inside me. And I ate it up. I mean, it's my dad. And so by the time I was seven, I knew I could be anything. And, and I can. And I was like, I'm going to be an astronaut or I could be a teacher or a woman on the Supreme Court of the United States. Or I could be the person that cleans up the trash every Tuesday. And there's nothing too high or too low for me. And, and so I was walking this world, a seven year old empowered girl. And I think the enemy tried to use sexual abuse to tear that down. I mean, I was eight years old when my sister's first husband started sexually abusing me. And I didn't know what was going on. I, I didn't know what sex was. I knew kissing was something that came out on TV and you're not supposed to look and we didn't talk about it. And then when I was nine in sex ed in the fifth grade is when I was shook. I, I remember being so upset. I threw up like the anger was so much because, because of what was going on, but because also I felt fooled. 
and I felt dumb. And and to this day, if I don't watch that, whenever someone tells me I'm dumb, I will get defensive. I'll get angry. Um, and, and so I have to watch that trigger. And so when I, when he tried it again, and I was nine, a whole year had passed and a, a couple um, incidences, he tried to touch me. And for the first time I said, no, um, I didn't freeze. I didn't go off into my, my, my story, whatever book I was reading. I, I stayed in the moment and opened my eyes and said no to him. I yelled it and he covered up my mouth with his hand and I'll never forget it because now I know that's the day he tried to rob my voice. And now I know that my voice is so powerful because people don't try to rob things that don't have value. So he tried to steal something from me that was very powerful. And so that's why I use my voice. But he told me, hey, you know, be quiet. You better not tell anyone or I'll kill your sister. And I was nine with the fear that entered my life of, of death and of her death and that he would kill her. And because we witnessed domestic violence all the time with them, it was a possibility. And so I felt at nine, 10, 11, for a very large part of my, my young life that I had to protect, defend and save so many people. And that that saving was sacrificing me. And now I know that the only savior is Christ, that I am no one's savior, and that I don't have to sacrifice myself for anyone else that's already been done. But at 10 years old, when you think you have to save your sister's life and go through this pain and silence, you stop thinking about Barbies and astronauts and teachers. All you wanna do is, is take the stress off. So I started drinking at 13, drugs at 16, um, abusing them heavily at 18. And I was just like functioning. I was a straight A student because I wanted to see if my value could come from my diploma and the pain could go away with the substances. And that's kind of how I live my life. Wow. And to go through that all as a teenager and especially it's almost as if it sounds like he tried to steal your voice, but really he amplified it. He gave you that like substances could not break that he so many people go through that and they feel as if their voice is stolen but time and time again we hear these stories from men and women who have been sexually abused and they're really amplifying your voice indirectly so one thing that they were using to be selfish with and they wanted some pleasure out of it especially with him being a family member you trusted him mm -hmm. yeah he, there was no reason not to yeah. Um, I had known him since I was four. He was never mean to me. Um, he, he was a totally different guy in front of other people. So, uh, I now know it wasn't my fault, but it took a long time to be able to, to figure that out, especially when he begins abusing his daughter. And then, and that was, I found out at 13 and I was so upset with myself. I mean, before I had just hated him. Now I hated myself because I'm like, your plan didn't work and you should have done this and you should have done that and avoided someone else's pain. And so that I think that's when the substance abuse began, um, when I really hated myself. Um, and, and sexual abuse really tries to kill your identity and the identity of your creator. You, you don't know who he is because the images that God can use in our life, a, a father, a male, um, you know, everything that we're told, you know, no one can touch us. We're protected that sexual abuse, if you, especially when you have to go through it alone, questions everything. And so I started to question, I knew God existed, but I had no idea what he was like. I genuinely didn't know if I was the only little girl it happened to, or if it happened to everyone and we just didn't talk about it. I didn't know if God didn't care or if he didn't know, or if he could like, I don't, I, I was really genuinely confused. So by the time I was 25, I, I had a child out of wedlock, uh, but I had married someone else just cause he was the only guy that wanted to. I literally knew, I, I knew him. I dated him for like three months and in a parking lot one day, he's just like, Hey, you want to marry me? Sure. Like, I didn't even like him. I was just desperate for a family, for love. And, uh, he started to, to, 
verbally abused me three days later he there was a lot of like toxic and psychological abuse where it's like i have to take away your makeup and take away all your clothes and he would just throw my stuff away and 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 isolate me from my friends and my family and call me the worst names and i believed him because to me it was a confirmation of what i had been telling myself since i was eight you're you're good for nothing all you you're good for is sex and not even that good at it and people could just throw you away after. So at least he's not throwing you away. And it was horrific. And I think my my bottom came when uh, he raped me. And I, I mean, I didn't want to have sex with him. He had just called me so many names all day. I felt like trash. I didn't want to be intimate with anyone. And uh, he, he raped me and threw me out of the hotel room with just his t-shirt on. And the guy at the front desk thought I was a prostitute and I didn't know him and he didn't know me and I've never done that. Um, And I just put the label on, sure, I'm a prostitute and little girl was supposed to be an astronaut and here I am a prostitute. And that's when I said, you know what? I'm just gonna kill myself. I'm gonna relieve myself, but also everyone else of me. I'm gonna relieve my daughter of me. She'll be better off without me. Um, my parents won't stress anymore. My mama will rest because I'm a failure. And, and I try to kill myself. And, and in that 2 AM in the middle of the street in some dark city or street in LA half drunk and, and drugged up on, I think it was Tylenol taking like 40 Tylenol at once. I just cried out to God and said, Hey, can you just take my life? I, I don't even know if I could do it. I can't take it. And, but you know, just do whatever you want with it. I'm going to go to sleep on the street right now. And if I get run over, just do what you want when I wake up. And, and I was thinking one thing, I was thinking of physical death. And what I was really doing was allowing God to move. I was giving him authority to move in my life and do what he wanted with my life. And he did. And it's been fantastic, difficult. There's been tears. It hasn't been easy. But in fact, sometimes... I'm like, wow, is there more trials because of this? I don't know, but ah, he's never left me. And I, I sometimes thought about leaving the walk, leaving the way, just because I feel not like I'm not good enough. Like I can't get this right. And then I'm like, but where would I go? Like the drinking, the smoking, the, I can't, I can't anymore. So um, like, I know that the peace and the joy, and the healing that I need is right here. And going through that almost detrimental season of your life leading up to wanting to kill yourself. Were you a Christian at that time? Were you a believer your whole life? Or was this the first time God really moved in you? Mm, My mom became a believer when I was nine years old. So she would drag us to church, like literally had to drag me. (laughs) And I was that girl on the back roads, like, oh, whatever. And I can't wait to get out of here. Um, And I thought I wasn't paying attention. I mean, I liked the way the guy preached. I was like, whoa, he's talented. Okay, that's interesting. I, I, you know, I love literature. So to me, the Bible has always been a beautiful book, but it wasn't alive to me. And I didn't want it. I, I didn't feel worthy of it. I felt that God would reject me if he really knew who I was. So before he rejected me, I would reject him. And that's kind of how I live my life. And so at 25, My mom had invited me to church for 11 years, every single Sunday. And I was always like, nope, because it's full of hypocrites and liars. And and in my really weak moments, I would, you know, tell my mom, mom, they're not going to receive me. Look at me. Like she knew about the abortion. She knew about the drugs and alcohol. And she didn't know how bad it was, but she knew she saw her daughter for who she was. But then she would also tap into what heaven saw and what heaven said about me. And she would tell me like, you're amazing. You're going to be a speaker. You're a great evangelist. Thousands are going to come to the Lord through you. You are a great woman of God. And I, I used to think she was crazy. And now I know she's a great woman of faith. So when I called my mama that Sunday morning, like, Hey, I'm going to take you to church. She was like, don't you mess with me. They won't let me sing. If I'm late, they don't care if I'm the pastor's mama. And I, I drove her to church and I, smelled. I was hung over. I don't think I had even showered. I just felt like dead. And she didn't say a word. I think she was interceding. 
And so when I just got to church that day, I don't remember what they preached about. I remember some of the songs, but I just knew I was loved. I, I knew it like, like it was the realest thing, the most true thing I've ever known is that I'm loved and his mercy is what transformed me. It, it was his mercy um, that, that to this day can still make me weep and that I still need every single morning. So I'm glad he has it for me, for us. Well, definitely does. And he's walking you and your family through this season of we've been through the hardships. There's probably going to be more to come, but God, we trust you. You're our defender. Now, I, when did the spotlight come into your life and how did that uh, transpire? I mean, my family has been famous since I was about 13. Like They kind of fell into it. I mean, my dad owned a recording studio but none of us ever took one vocal class or, and my brother became famous, my sister became famous. And now I know that it was the plan of God, but I was always avoiding it. I was, I was chubby and I didn't see myself as talented in that way. I didn't know I had any talent and I was always running from cameras and I had sworn to myself, to my father, I will never be in the media ever, ever father. Like my sister was like, Hey, you could at least be a, a sports reporter, a news reporter. I'd be like, not even that, you know, that's like, um, I don't want to be in front of a camera. I don't want to talk to people. I was hiding from family parties. So when my sister dies 2012, I mean, my biggest fear came true. I had been dreading this since I was nine and she knew it. I would text her sister, please don't ever, ever die. And her reply would be, you're at a funeral, aren't you? And I would say, yes. And I don't know how the sister's not, I don't know how she's standing because I would be dead, sister. I will die without you. I'll be depressed. I'll go back to the drinking. I'll, I'll, you know, I said, take me with you. Just pray to God that when you go, he takes me with you. And, and he didn't. And I was so upset. Um, so I'm, I'm, going through the most horrific, tragic, scary, painful situation in my life. And not only did I lose my sister, I lost my privacy in one day, just as soon as it leaked that I was her trustee, there was cameras camped out outside the house. What's Rosie going to do? What's she going to say? What's she like? Can she do this? Is she strong enough? Well, she's a girl and she doesn't even sing. Why would Jenny choose her? Oh, she's going to fail. And I was just trying to stand up in the morning <laughs> and try not to go back to the drinking and the smoking and the, and, uh, it's eight, it's been eight years. It's been, it's been war. I'm not crazy. I am not depressed. I didn't go back to the drugs. I tried the drinking a little bit and it didn't give me what I needed. I can no longer depend on it. I, it doesn't numb what God can heal. And I know that. So uh, I just give him glory because I'm standing and I can smile and he's never left me. And so in these eight years, the scrutiny, the public scrutiny, oh, Lord. Um, but I am so glad that seven years before he, he gave me the platform, we worked on my identity. I know whose I am and I know that I am his daughter and he didn't say it was going to be easy, but I know that I'll have peace. The way he told the woman with the hemorrhage, he doesn't know her as the woman with the hemorrhage. That's what we call her. He called her daughter and he said, go in peace. And because you've been made whole. So I don't know what I'm going to face tomorrow, but in these eight years, I've had peace and I've been whole. Nothing has been able to break me down, destroy me, defeat me because I'm his daughter. And so I use that always. And, and just the way I defend my daughter with my imperfections as a parent, my, my father defends me like the apple of his eye. And, you know, it's not always easy. Sometimes I'm like, you're taking too long. You're not doing it the way I want. What am I supposed to do while I wait? Um, and that's what this book is about is everything that I learned waiting for God to defend me for 18 years from the man that sexually abused me. Once I gave him to God and I just said, you know what, Lord, I'm tired of looking for him. I'm tired of wanting to kill him. I'm tired of being bitter. You do it. I'm going to focus on healing. And the first thing he told me was forgive him. And that conversation with God was very interesting. So I was like, are you crazy? Uh, he's not. 
it was it was a great process in the sense that God was with me every step. It took about four or five months to forgive this man. And the only reason I knew it was because I saw him being arrested and I knew the pain he was going to be in. And it wasn't necessarily satisfying in what I thought it would be. I mean, justice is great and justice is, is victory for so many of us, but I didn't have to tell him. I didn't have a speech. I didn't have to hit him or prove my nothing. It was just like, man, this guy's going to jail. Now he's locked up and I'm free. I'm free in Christ. So praying to forgive someone really transforms you. And I'm so thankful for that. And so now when people attack me publicly, privately, families, strangers, church, um, I'm like, you know what? It cost Jesus way too much on the cross. And it cost me too much to forgive the man that sexually abused me. I'll just forgive him. I'll go through the process um, because I don't want anything to take my peace at all. To me, it's my my peace is so valuable and I, I don't let anyone take that anymore. Yeah. And instead of getting revenge, like physically, verbally uh, bashing them online, you're saying that the forgiveness and the grace that you give to them is the best thing you can do for your mental health and possibly even for them finding Jesus. How did you do that? Yes. Like what? Because when something <laughs> bad happens to anybody, I'll say myself, for example, I'm like, Oh, wait till they get theirs. But how did you come to the conclusion? Like, I'm just going to forgive them. Like it's less stress on me <laughs> and God's been good to me. Like that's, that's grace. That's a pure it's, example of what God gives us. I still go through that every single time. Every single time. If, if I mean, I say, and I'm not kidding you, I need the Holy Spirit to go to Walmart. Because a few years ago, being Christian, I still got in a fight at Walmart. <laughs> so it's, yeah, like, it's not that it's easy. It's not that, you know, it's, it's a muscle that I'm building. And for me, it's like, I want to bounce back faster. That's it. It's not that, you know, I'm, I'm taking a hold of my ego faster and that's the goal and, and going to Christ faster and, and crying it out to him faster, whether than like spilling it out to 20 people and venting and spreading a rumor. Like I just want to bounce back faster. Um, so I go through it every single time I get just as mad and just as hurt. And I still have those same, like, Ooh, I can't wait till you, mm, and God's like, mm, you know? And so we, it's a process that I go through every single time, whether it's something small, like a bad Yelp review where you're like, or I don't know, something huge, like someone accusing me of theft so publicly. And I'm like, I could just, I will show them every single bank account. And Jesus is like, let me show them. God, but you're going to take long. It'll be for, you know, it'll, it'll be for your good. And, and so the lessons he has taught me in these process are so valuable to me and to my children. I mean, my 18 year old says, I'm so glad my, my younger siblings have a better mom. And that's not offensive at all. She grew up in the transition of angry Rosie, kill him Rosie, um, to healing. And I was never abusive with her, but I was so mad all the time that her mind said, well, if I mess up, she'll transfer that anger to me. And, and she is a very talented, very gorgeous, charming young lady, but she was scared. And so my seven-year-old, eight-year-old, she's not scared. She will do, she will say she's a little sassy. And I love that sass. It, it's, it's difficult sometimes, but I don't want to take that from her. So my kids don't know me as angry Rosie anymore. And that is so beneficial. I didn't even know that could be one of the rewards 15 years ago when I was trying, when I decided to obey Jesus and forgive this man. And it isn't even me. It is, it is the Holy Spirit that empowers me. All I had to do was make the choice. And it wasn't because he deserved it. And it wasn't because I knew how the benefits it was. I wanted to obey Christ. That's it. I just want to obey you. And, and in that, thank God is where I found true joy and peace. Wow. And a lot of people 
probably see you on Instagram, 1.6 million followers. <laughs> like you've navigated the money, the fame, every single aspect. But the conclusion of all of this and the one message I would like people to take away, and I want to ask your opinion on that after, is money, fame, glamour, none of that is the end game. That's not going <laughs> to kill you. <laughs> There's so much that goes into that and you don't have privacy. You don't have people that work nine to five and have a basic salary and such get to go home and turn it off. You can't go to Walmart. You can't go to target. I see people posting memes all the time. Like go to target, get all this. Like that has to be a chore now. Like you had all of it land in your lap. You didn't ask for it, but yeah. it's going to heal people. And for people that are listening are like, man, I, I don't care what you're saying, Trevor. Like if I had money, if I had fame, all of this would be fixed. Yeah, you no, I, I have lived it all. Like I think of Paul who said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But the verses before it, are, hey, I've been loved and I've been hated. I've been rich, I've been poor. I've been educated and ignorant. And, and in it all, I have found contentment. I have learned that money doesn't make you better. Um, money doesn't necessarily make you worse. It, it's neither good or bad, it just is. It can magnify who you are now. So you're like, oh, when I make money, I'm a tithe. When I make money, I'm going to donate. No, if you're not doing it now with the 10 bucks you have, I mean, even if it's 10 cents, 20 cents, you're not going to do it when you're a millionaire. It will magnify who you are. So are you ready to be magnified? Are you ready to really see yourself? Because that's what it does. And so sometimes I feel that there are so many blessings for us. I mean, the word says it, but we're not ready. God's ready. He's like, I, I want to child, but I wouldn't give my 12 year old a Z28 Camaro. I waited till she could drive. And, and it wasn't even her first car. She can't handle the power. So I want to train her, coach her. And I think that's what God's doing for us. He's not withholding goodness from you. He is waiting until we're ready for the goodness so that we don't destroy it or destroy ourselves along the way. And I just know that the most and I could say it now, and I'm, I'm so happy I can say it with all my heart. The most precious thing to this day that I know is Christ's love and mercy and his grace. It's just the Holy Spirit. I cannot live without him. I cannot. I need him. And I've lived through it all. And so not all. I don't want to say that. Through a lot. And what I've lived through. The greatest gift I've ever been given is the advocate is my Holy Spirit. So um I, yeah, it's okay. If, if you have ambitions, being content does not mean not have ambitions. It doesn't mean I'm not going to move or work or do something. It just means I trust in the, in the plan and the process that God has for me. I, I trust it. And that's hard sometimes. I get you. So go out there, work, you know, do, do what you got to do, but don't depend on that house. Don't, not for your value, certainly not for your value and, and not for your joy. To me, that only comes from God. Mm. And it's so easy to see now the reason that God gave you the influence that you have. You're <laughs> stewarding it so well. Extravagant generosity. If you can't be extravagant with the little finances that you have now, that's exactly right. You can't, you're not going to do it because you're not used to it. Building healthy habits now with the little things that people may have. It's just so beautiful. And Rosie, thank you so much for just being here today. And where can people find out more about all of the ventures that you have, including your nonprofit and uh, Netflix shows and everything? You can go to uh, Instagram is where I'm most active. So Rosie Rivera, but also Facebook, YouTube, uh, TikTok. And um, if you want to get the book, it's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um, uh, Premier Collectibles. You could just go to my my bio on Rosie Rivera or godisyourdefender.com. Awesome. And we're going to link all of that in the description below. Thank you again for being here. Thank you so time. much, Trevor. It was such a great talk. Yeah. And this episode has been brought to you by a new release today. We're going to have all of Rosie's info linked in the description below. And just remember the core message of this whole episode, God is your defender. Go check out Rosie's book, her socials, and we'll talk to you guys next week.